Praise the Lord. Um, I'm, I'm just excited. I've been on this uh, 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 high and on this energy and, and uh, just really, um, really thanking God for what God is doing in this, in this season and um, just renewing the mind and just uh, meditating on the Word of God, speaking the Word of God, uh, controlling my negative thoughts and dealing with uh, the adversity that tries to arise in me, reprogramming. Uh, my subconscious mind and renewing the spirit of my mind and I can feel just the momentum of uh, God we received some tickets in the in the mail to a uh, seminar and I wasn't gonna go my wife uh, said that we should go you know and, and I, after I thought about it, I was like well you know what it'd be good um, to, to really receive and this was the the uh, seminar they did today I believe they have one is it tomorrow Saturday, where's that going to be at? Okay, it's going to be in Grand Rapids. So if, you know, some people want to uh, go, and of course I knew they would be promoting and, and selling his package, but this is um, Damon Johns, which is one of the uh, sharks off a of Shark Tank. How many seen seen that show, The Shark Tank? Okay, and so he has a team of uh, professionals that work with, the people that they give the money to. He doesn't necessarily work with them, but he's trained his team, and so his team goes and works with them, and his team goes out and they, and they train. And to our amazement, as they began to teach, they talked about wealth, and so these are billionaire principles that are coming from a multi-billionaire. Those of you that don't know Damon, he's responsible for FUBU Forest by us. He also um, is responsible for uh, uh, Kuji, uh, he's also a partner with um, Fat Farm, with um, uh, Russell Simmons, and a hundred other different companies um, that they make millions and billions of dollars. And so um, he was teaching some of these principles and, and obviously selling his entrepreneur training course um, to uh, really begin to be trained in wealth. And it was amazing because as I sat, sat, sat there, uh, they began to talk about the same things that we're talking about right here now. Um, and uh, I looked up, I think Sister Trellis was there, and uh, Brother brother Walter, uh, we brought him with us. And then I brought uh, uh, my son over there, amen, Attorney Rodney Lewis Stevenson II. And uh, so we were, we were there receiving. And um, I, I, do, I was going to have Sister Trellis just come out here and just share a couple things that, that she gleaned from uh, what he was saying, I took some notes um, today, and I just sat there and, and, and laughed because I'm like, okay, God, you're giving us these same principles, the same uh, of wisdom, and so as we um, begin to uh, receive this, we're going to believe that God's just going to impart that spirit of wealth on us, and we're getting ready to go to a whole nother level, Amen. amen. Um, just like Apostle Rod, when I was sitting there, I was like, unbelievable. The word that we're receiving right now in this season, I'm going to encourage everybody to grab it, hold it, meditate on it, muse it, because we're in that same vein of now, the same exact vein. So he was saying some things that were so powerful. Um, when I came, I was so excited. I kept looking back at Apostle Rod because he was saying some words that, like, wow, wow. But... Um, a lot of the stuff that he was saying, um, it takes the same energy to think small as it does to think big. And we never think like that. It's the same energy. Um, and Apostle talked about working with a team. He has a team of professionals. We have a team of professionals right here. Um, he talked about truth. And I think one of the biggest things that he talked about when he talked about uh, investments, uh, if you have 400, was it with $4,000? What are you going to do with that $4,000? And I equated that to the, when the, um, the wise guy gave the talents to, the parable about the talents, because that's what he was speaking about. He was actually, everything he was saying was biblical, but it was being used for the word. And you can hear in the spirit was just speaking out loud, was crying out loud. Um, when he talked about uh, wealth don't come to you. You got to go get the wealth. And then to become successful, you got to go to wealth. Wealthy people are not going to come to you. You have to go to the wealthy people. And the choices, Paul always talk about the choices we make. 
is the difference between us and the wealthy people. He said the same exact thing, the same way Apostle had said it. Um, I got about 12 pages of notes. Uh oh. I'm not going to say all of them. <laughs> But positive affirmation. Apostle just talked about that. Um, we always talking about we trying. He said, get rid of it. Yes. Get rid of it. He said, wealthy people don't talk like we do. We always, I'm trying to get my business started. I'm working on my business plan. They don't do that. They, don't, they speak positive. So get you some positive affirmations. Get you some positive speaking words. Start sowing those words into your, uh, and he talked about the conscience. The subconscious and the conscious. I'm telling you, we are right here. But we're right here in the body of Christ. So it's time for us to come up. It's a body of Christ. Um, continuously invested. He talked about, Apostles always talking about um, Warren Buffett and um, Bill Gates. He used an analogy about Bill Gates, um, how he sows and he invests. He don't keep no money in the bank. They don't keep no more than $500,000 in the bank. That's it. We thinking they got all these millions and they got money in the bank. They invest in it. They're making more money, making more. Your money is supposed to make more money. And he talked about even having those businesses and having an exit. You're not supposed to be there. Even though you got a business, you're supposed to, somebody else is supposed to come up under you and run that business to give you freedom to live. And he talked about retirement. Retirement is when you did. That's exactly how he said it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he, did. he said retirement is when you did. I never thought about it like that because we all living to get to retirement because we're thinking there's, there's going to be a rainbow at the end. There ain't going to be no rainbow at the end. So it was very enlightening. Like I said, I got uh, like 11 pages, 12 pages of a note, and there were some key things that I wanted to share before I give the mic back to the Apostle. Um, oh, framing your world. Uh, he said, your whole world is created by the words that come out of your mouth. The world is using that. The wealthy people are using that. But we have it hard just speaking the scriptures. I want to encourage everybody after what I went through today and just hearing it, the power behind it. Um, and that course actually was $4,000. Four we got it for free, but he called us broke people. He said, if you're sitting in that chair, you broke. He kept saying, and if you get mad, and there was quite a few people that got up and walked out. He said, it happens all the time. But for every one person that was in that room, it represented a thousand. And there was a many people, there was many people in there, but there were many people that couldn't take the truth because he spoke the truth. He talked about the truth. He made mention of the truth. He said, people don't like the truth. And that is the truth. Um, he also talked about being having childlike faith. I call it childlike faith. He said being like a child to learn. We have to reprogram our thinking. And he said it needs to start now, how we think. Um, and then just keep this. I'm going to let Apostle have this back. Um, <laughs> keep this in mind. Your job is called uh, just over broke. Just over broke. So every time you talk about a job, you're talking about being just over broke. I'm telling you, the man was in there. Amen. You can go ahead and take it back. Thank you. Amen. Give her a hand. Amen. Thank you for, um, for, just, for just sharing that. And I really wanted her to just share because these are obviously billionaires that are teaching um, these, these principles. And when we look at... Our life, our life is a product of who we are and how we think and how we've been trained to think. And so we just need to retrain our mind. Yeah. That's why the scripture says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And so we're renewing the spirit of our mind. And we do that by dealing with negative thoughts. I want to just uh, talk about a couple key points that I pulled from uh, what he was saying. One of the things he said is 90% of wealth is changing the uh, a programming of your mind. 90% of wealth is changing the programming of your mind. He's talked about it being, being very easy and talked about it uh, being systematic. And so building wealth in a systematic way really is very easy. You just simply have to change the way that you think, change 
the programming of your mind. Once again, get rid, getting rid of I'm trying. Uh, that has to be eliminated from your vocabulary. Uh, words like I don't have enough produce what, what, what he called negative energy. I just call it a spirit of poverty. Because when, when we speak negative, negative, it comes out of that poverty mindset. And sometimes we don't realize that we have a poverty mindset. One of the things that he talked about, if you're sitting in the seat, you're broke. And he said he, he made this millionaire mad because he said it was a guy that had retired. He had $2 million sitting in, in the bank, and he was saying that you're broke. And, and so the guy got offended, and he got upset. He jumped up out of the chair. He went to the back, and, and he bought the course, and he came back. He jumped in his face, and he was like, you know, I'm not broke. I got $2 million sitting, sitting in the bank. He says, you're broke. He said, because your money's not doing anything. <laughs> it's just sitting. So your, your system is broke. It's not working for you. And, you know, it's interesting because in, in America, our banks hardly pay us anything. And that's why uh, most uh, investors that have a large sum of money invest uh, overseas or offshore. How many have heard of people talking about uh, an offshore account? Okay, the reason they say that is because even like in South Africa, the banks pay 10% on savings account. I say 10% on the savings account. You know how much we get on the savings account? A fee. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Point zero something, if you can figure it out. Amen. Uh, basically nothing. Um, I think they pay like 1.5% on a 10-year CD. And so um, America is very interesting because it is the number one free country in the world. This is something that shocked me. He said over 600,000 millionaires are produced in America every single year. Hello? That's good enough to be in that number, isn't it? I said 600,000, not six. 600,000 millionaires are produced in America every single year. And I think we got some people here that need to be in that number. And so understanding that wealth is easy. He talked about wealth being easy because it's done in a certain way. And that's exactly what we talked about last uh, a week. We, we, we talked about things being done in a certain way. He also talked about wealth is also an energy that we produce. I believe that wealth is a spirit that we embrace. That when we begin to speak the language, it attaches itself and connects itself um, to us and... Um, among us. And then lastly, he talked about a couple different wealth principles. Number one, we must realize that you are responsible for where you are today. You're also responsible for your future. He talked about getting on the right side of every equation, meaning every uh, deal or every transaction that you make, make sure you're on the right side. And then number three, he talked about don't be afraid to uh, make decisions and take risks. So in, in other words, we have to be able to pull the trigger. And so we're dealing with uh, this whole subject. I want to talk about how riches come today. We're going to talk about how wealth comes. Amen. I don't like to use the word riches. I like to use the word wealth. How wealth comes. And we need to understand that wealth will come to you. The Bible says that money answereth all things. Money answereth all things. Now, that's a powerful statement. Money answereth all things. Money. You know, it takes money to get folks saved. How many of y'all realize that? I don't care if you get in your car and drive down somewhere to witness. Guess what? It took some money to get there. <laughs> Amen. To go there. Money answereth all things. We need finances. We need resources. And so understanding that, wealth comes in an interesting way. Amen. If you don't have the book, please download the book from our website. Our website, amen, is rolwmuskegon.com. The acronym stands for Rivers of Living Water Muskegon. Uh, you'll see a free PDF. You'll see the book there um, that says The Science of Getting Rich. That is the book that we're teaching from. And I'm actually teaching from... Uh, page 23, and it's chapter number 6. It says this, when I say that you don't have to drive sharp bargains, I do not mean that you do not have to drive any bargains at all, that you are above the necessity for having any dealings with your fellow man. 
I mean that you will not need to deal with them unfairly. You do not have to get something for nothing, but can give to every man more than you take from him. Okay? One of the principles that the Lord taught me is that sometimes in business that we're, we can be greedy, that we always feel that we have to have the biggest piece of the pie. Wealthy people don't think that way. Okay? And how the Lord taught, taught me this is, uh, I had established um, a, a mortgage company. We had a mortgage banking company. Uh, we had a real estate company where we were buying, flipping, selling, selling properties. And then an opportunity came to me. Uh, there was a group of bankers and real, realtors in the local area here that were starting um, a mortgage, excuse me, they were starting a title company. A title company does the, the processing, the paperwork, the deeds, and all that for people that are uh, buying uh, houses or uh, 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 commercial biz businesses. And so they asked me to become one of the partners, which was a brilliant idea because, number one, uh, it would be self-sustaining. And so the young, young man that came up with this was uh, a gentleman that we had been dealing with from a local title uh, a company that had used to work for Harbor Title Company. And when he approached me, he needed you know, a certain amount of money for a 10% stake in this investment. And I said, yes. And the first thing that I thought of is, how can I get more? But he was like, well, this is it. This is the last uh, share that you can have. And so I bought a 10% stake within this property. And so the idea was that since all the bankers handled all the mortgages, all the realtors handled all the houses, that we would take all of our deals and send it to our own company that we owned as a partnership. And so it would be self-sustained. And I sat there and I thought about it and I said, you know what, this is a powerful investment. Number one, because I don't ever have to go into work there. N neither do I have to go in and do nothing. And I receive a return every quarter. I receive um, a profit check, amen, for my percentage within the corporation. All I had to do was to send uh, uh, um, uh, the clients, amen, to the company that we all own a part share of. This is how wealthy people think. When you look at the Shark Tank, they don't try to own 100% of the company. They just need what? A piece. So what they're literally doing is this. They're giving more than what they're receiving. But what happens is God will never let you outgive him. So what you give and what you sow, you receive a greater return on. And uh, one of the gentlemen showed that Damon had given uh, one of these gentlemen on the Shark Tank a $50,000 loan. He had came up with some idea with this fancy belt. And for, from the $50,000, he was receiving a million-dollar return every single year from this investment. Now, how, how many think that's a good, good investment? It was for a 20% stake in his particular company. So wealthy people understand that they give more than what they're simply taking. And so you do not have to have the majority of the deal, the majority of the profit. It's okay to just go into uh, some type of a, a deal and receive a piece of it and give more than what you're receiving. There's a, there, there's a principle that I will use in my business and I will tell all of my uh, workers, under promise, over deliver. Come on, say that. Under promise, over deliver. Why? Because I hated people that over promised and under delivered. I wanted them to feel that when they got done doing business with us and they shook hands, I wanted them to feel like they got more than what they really were promised. Why? Because I knew that they would tell their friends, they would tell their other family, and they would go back and it would be residual uh, uh, business for us. And so we want to give more, amen than what we're actually putting in. Let's, let's suppose that uh, you owned uh, a picture by one of the greatest artists, and this is an example that he uses, which is any civilized community is worth thousands of dollars. I take it to a Biffany Ray and, uh, and buy salesmanship, induce an Eskimo to give me a bundle of furs worth $500 for it. I have really wronged him for he has no use for the pitcher. So the Eskimo has no use for the pitcher, correct? It has no use or value to him. It will not add to his life, even though it is worth more than 
the $500 for first. But suppose I give him, amen, a hunting rifle worth $50 for his furs. Then he has made a good bargain. Why? Because he has the use of the gun and it will give him many more furs and much food. It will add to his life in every way. It will make him rich. When you rise from the competitive to the creative plane, you can scan your business transactions very strictly. And if you are selling any man anything which does not add more to his life than the thing he gave you in exchange, you can afford to stop it. You do not have to beat anybody in business. And if you are in business which does beat people, get out of it at once. You know, one of the principles that my father used, and, and before he passed, uh, he had a bunch of different apartment houses. And uh, I had the privilege of dealing with uh, all of those apartment houses in the Muskegon Hikes for about two years, which uh, was torment for me. And he, he always said something. He said, son, I keep my rents low because I don't want them to ever go somewhere else where they can find something cheaper. And I was thinking, well, you can get more for these apartments than, than this. Because he had one house he was renting to um, um, a lady, but he owned the house free and clear. So he didn't have any mortgage on it. And he was renting the whole house to the lady for $375. You know how long she stayed there? 17 years. She bought that house. I ran the numbers, and I'm like, wow. Because when he bought the house, he only paid like six, $6,000 for it some way, way, way years, years ago. And like clockwork, she paid him $375 a month every single month. And so what, what, what was he doing? He was giving her more than what she could get anywhere else. And so it was a win-win sit situation. He was not trying to get the maximum from the house that he could actually get, but he did business in a creative way. And some, sometimes, uh, you know, when we look at people do things, we don't understand the wisdom. I was a young man. I didn't see the wisdom in it. I see and I understand the wisdom in it now that, you know, he taught me and gave me, you know, an understanding of what he was actually uh, doing in this whole process. And so we have to change the way that we think. Amen? Because people of wealth think differently. So we, we, we under-promise, over-deliver. We give every man more in use value than you take from him in cash value. Then you are adding to the life of the world by every business transaction that you do. Does that make sense? Even if you have um, employees, because sometimes, um, you know, when we have, have, have employees, companies that are thriving companies uh, are companies that recruit from within the company. And they create advancement and growth within the company. So people rise up through the ranks within the company. And, and one of the things that happened, I read a book by Lee I. Coca. And uh, they call this the Japanese uh, management philosophy. And that was when the Japanese began to outpace America with the production of uh, their energy efficient cars. And one of the things that they did is that they pr promoted from within and they pulled the people from the plant into the boardroom in order for them to help make decisions. Why? Because they were the people that were dealing with these vehicles every single day. And they eventually became the managers. They became the CEOs. They became the people that were in the executive boardrooms. They provided free education for them to go to school, to, to learn. And so now they simply worked their way through the ranks and they began to develop stronger companies than we did. Why? Because we weren't doing things in that way. We're hiring people, and some of our companies still do that. We hire people out of college or from some you know, prestigious university. We put them in a corporate boardroom. They do not know anything. Then they just send the people off in the plant. You know, they frustrate them because they're green. The people in the plant are saying, I've been here for 30 years, and you know, here's this kid that wants to do something because he's been taught you know, out of Hartford in a textbook, and employee morale is destroyed, and we're wondering why we don't have an effective company. And so even with uh, doing business and having employees, we want to uh, provide a way that uh, we promote 
and we create advancement and growth from within the corporation. Amen. All right. Let me talk, talk, talk about this because I wanted to spend the majority of my time tonight dealing with this particular subject. Go with me to Romans chapter four, verse 17. In Romans chapter 4, four verse 17, it's talking about Abraham here. And it says, As it, is, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead. You, you might be dead, amen? <laughs> God will quicken in your dead subconscious or your dead spirit. We ask God to quicken our spirit, amen? Ask God to quicken my mind, Lord. Quicken my mind. He quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. How does God speak? He calls those things that be not as though they were. So he doesn't say that I'm broke. Why? Because we're not broke. Everything that we need is within us. Why? Because the kingdom is where? The kingdom is in you. So how can we be broke if the kingdom of God is on the inside of us? We're never broke. We're an endless supply of resources. We are an, a, a treasure in an earthen vessel. Yes. There is treasure in an earthen vessel. And so as we begin to learn to extract from the God-given divine nature that's on the inside of us, and then we speak to that thing, we begin to hold that thing Amen. In faith and believe and receive it, it will be done according to our faith. It will be done unto us according to our faith. A powerful principle of, of wealth is gratitude. Somebody say gratitude. gratitude. Being thankful. Yes. Being thankful. Being thankful, complacent with where you are, with what God has given you, with, with what you have. Contentment, yeah. Being content with what you have, with what God has given you. Amen? That's not saying that you may not have a desire for something better or something greater or something, something more, but you're thankful. How do, how do we know we're not thankful? Because we complain about what we have. We complain about, you know, what we drive. We complain about where we live. We complain about what we, you know, have to eat. Or we complain about, you know, where we work. Or we complain about where we worship. And it's interesting because a lot of times it's the same job that we begged and prayed and fasted and sold seeds for God to get. And then God gives it to us. And, and we say, you know what, I hate this job. I can't stand going. Every time I, you know, come, come to this place, it just makes me sick to my stomach. I can't stand being here. And we don't have an attitude of gratitude. Somebody say, I must have an attitude, have an attitude. Of, gratitude. of gratitude. The illustration gives, or given in the last chapter, conveyed to the reader the fact that the first step toward getting wealthy is to convey the idea of your wants to the formless substance. The formless substance we're talking about is faith. Amen? This is true. And you will see that in order to do it, becomes necessary to relate yourself to the formless intelligence that's on the inside of you. Now, we talked about the formless intelligence, which is really created in your subconscious, which is the spirit of your mind. It will create and it will do whatever you program it and feed it in your conscious mind to do. Whatever you speak, that's what it's going to do. It cannot reason. It cannot figure out right and wrong. It will just simply perform what you put in it to do. That's how God created and designed us. If you get nothing from what we're saying uh, 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 over the course of these weeks that we're teaching it, make sure you get that and begin to feed it the right thing so now while you're asleep, it's working for you. While you're not even conscious, it's working for you. Because that part of your mind actually works 
while the other part of your mind is not functioning. Let me rephrase that. That part of your mind actually works the best when the conscious part of your mind is not working. That's why meditation is so powerful. That's why learning to steal your mind, to worship, to think on other things, to be in a state of peace, to get quiet. The Bible says that in stillness you will know God. He says what? Be still and know me. Why? Because God dwells in a place of peace. The Father, I'm talking, in a place of stillness. And that is the place where we can simply meditate and our mind can begin to work and achieve the things that we want to achieve. So what we have to do is stop working so hard in the natural and learn how to work in the spirit. Let the spirit of your mind begin to do the work by you feeding it like a furnace. And feeding what? Feeding it with the word of God. Feeding it with positive things. Feeding it with things of wealth. Feeding it with things of peace. Feeding it with things of hope. Feeding it with things of prosperity. The whole process of mental adjustment and atonement can be summed up in one word. is simply gratitude, being thankful. Why? Because if you're ungrateful, then what, what, what happens is it, is it, is, is it speaks to uh, 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 your, your spirit man that you're not happy. And what it does is it continues to create this atmosphere of misery. It continues to create an atmosphere of misery and it draws other unhappy folk to you. It draws other miserable folk to you. It draws other broke people to you. This is why, you know, one of the things that he, he, he said was to go to find wealthy people. And when you be around wealthy people and, and, and sometimes you, you're uncomfortable around wealthy, wealthy people. Amen. Because sometimes you don't even know how to act. I was, I was, um, telling my wife that uh, we had got a boat and went out to uh, the marina. We, we had a boat that we bought in Holland, and it was the first time that I had to dock this boat. And I'm like, God, it had to be that a bunch of guys sitting on the dock, I pull into the dock, got the owner, Mr. Keenan right there. They're sitting there. Everybody's drinking. And then some black guy from Detroit is with them, and he said, look at his brother coming in here. Yeah, that's my brother. And I'm thinking, God, this is the first time I'm about to pull his boat into the dock. Please don't let me hit somebody else's boat. <laughs> I mean, because I'm, I'm pulling into where there's yachts. This is a 40-foot slip. And I'm thinking, oh, Jesus. First time, I drove the boat back, and I'm backing up. My heart's racing. I'm like, please let me be able to pull it. And I pull it in successfully. You should have seen the brother go off. Yeah, that's my brother. You know, they, they are drunk and drinking anyway. So, you know, it's like, yeah, that's it. You showed them how to do it. <laughs> and I'm thinking, God, thank you, Jesus. But it was interesting because being in an environment with people of wealth and affluence and different people. And I told you guys about this one guy. I mean, he was a stockbroker that owned this huge, huge yacht. And he would come down. He'd be bragging all the time, talking about, you know, uh, how much freedom he, you know, has and all these other, other, other things. And I'm like, you just Leviathan walking down the street. You're so full of pride. I, I need to cast the devil out of you right, right, right now. But the conversations and the things that they talked about, amen, were different subjects. Thinking differently, processing information differently. And sometimes we need to change the environment. And the reason we're uncomfortable is because we're not used to being around people of influence, people of, of wealth. We're more comfortable being around broke people. How many know sometimes we just need to be in uncomfortable situations? Amen? Amen. Gleaming from people. I intentionally, when I started my business, I said, I'm going to go, I'm going to make appointments with uh, banking presidents. I'm going to pick their brain, pick their mind, see how they think, because I needed to see how wealthy people thought. I needed to see the flight of wealthy people, but I wanted to identify even with those in my community. You know, when I, I think I called Jose Infantes up one, one day. I'm like, he was the owner of, you know, Community Shores Bank, and I asked to schedule an appointment with him. I told him I was working on an assignment, 
and I just wanted to see if I could spend 15 minutes and interview him. He was like, yeah, I set, set appointment, came in, I sat down, interviewed him. He was kind of curious, what, why was I doing this? He thought I was doing it for a school project. I said, no, I'm just doing it because I need a better understanding. And so he related to it. He understood it. Why? Because he knew what I was doing. It made sense. To somebody else, it was weird because I really didn't have a purpose. But the purpose was to simply get around people of wealth and influence and millionaires and see how they think. Plus, guess what? I was building a relationship as well. Amen? And so sometimes we need to do things a certain way. A certain way. Do things how? A certain way. Amen? A different way than how we're actually doing them. First, you believe that there is one intelligent substance from which all things proceed. Second, believe that the substance gives you everything you desire. And third, you relate yourself to it by feeling a deep and profound gratitude. So the substance that God has placed on the inside of us is the creative power, the divine nature of God. That is the substance. So I, I want you to know and understand that on the inside of you, God created a creative nature. And this is why it's so important for us to speak like Jesus spoke. Why? Because it's doing things in a certain way. Many people who order their lives rightly in all other ways are kept in poverty by their lack of gratitude. Having received one gift from God, they cut the wires which connect them with him by failing to make acknowledgement of him. So God does something for them, and they simply cut the wires. They don't keep on continually being grateful. See, we have to be grateful even in our struggles, thanking God for even uh, of the desert seasons, the dry seasons that we go through. Why? Knowing that the trying of our faith, being much more precious than, than uh, gold, though it be tried in the fire, might be found unto what? Who knows their scripture? Oh, my goodness. Oh, we need to turn. Turn there. Where is that? Uh, is that sec Second Peter? No. No, no, that's uh, Second Peter. The trying of your faith being much more precious than gold, though it may be found. Hey, Amen. Yeah, somebody find, uh, find that for me. And uh, let's just take a look, look at that, because that's a powerful scripture. Amen. That's a powerful scripture. So first, you believe that there is one intelligent substance from which all things is created. Second, you believe that the substance gives you everything you desire. And third, you relate yourself to it by feeling a deep and profound gratitude. A deep and profound gratitude. You found it, Elder? Uh, first Peter 1, 7. Okay, first, first Peter 1, 7. Can you uh, read that for us? Okay. Uh, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than, than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus. Okay, notice that it might be found what? Unto praise. Thanksgiving. Gratitude. Amen. Being grateful. So what he's saying is the trying of your fight, faith might be found unto praise. So now what you're doing is you're, 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 you're bringing gratitude. You're bringing praise. You're bringing thanksgiving into your trial because you understand that this is the process this is the way that God does things and now because you have a mind of wealth you accelerate amen that season you build momentum you accelerate it by bringing praise into it when everyone else says well I don't know what you're praising God for you don't really have anything you know to praise God for I'm praising him in the mix of the fire it's like the three Hebrew boys. And then all of a sudden, amen, you look and Jesus is right there. The appearing of the Lord Jesus is right there going through the trial, going through, amen, your, your situation right with you. So we must have this attitude of gratitude. The more grateful we fix our minds on the supreme God when good things come to, you, to us, the more good things we will receive. The more rapidly they will come to us and the reason simply is that the mental attitude of gratitude draws the mind into closer touch 
with the source from which all blessings come, and that is our Heavenly Father. It draws us to, to Him. It draws us to Him. Why? Because God says, I inhabit, I build my home where? There it is. He builds His home in the praises of his people. So when you're going through hard seasons or hardship or you're going through adversity and instead of praising God, you're complaining and murmuring, you're building an atmosphere for the adversary. God can't dwell in that. God can't come in. He can't step into your situation. Why? Because we've not given him access. We've not given him a place. We've not built a, a, a portal. We've not built, amen, a door for God to begin to come in. Praise opens the door. Praise steals the enemy. Matter of fact, uh, uh, the word praise in the Hebrew, amen, is Judah, but it also means to have your hand at the neck of your enemy. So what God does is he comes in and he puts his hand at the neck of the enemy. He stops the enemy, amen, from doing whatever he desired to do. Why? Because in the mix of your trial, in the mix, amen, of your suffering, you begin to offer up thanksgiving. You begin to offer up praise. And now accelerated blessings begin to come. Wealth and prosperity is released out of that. Healing is released out of it. Are you here, people of God? I'm preaching better than y'all giving me credit for. It is a new thought to you that gratitude brings your whole mind into closer harmony with the creative energies of the universe. Consider it well, and you will see that it is true. The good things you already have, ha have had come to you along the line of obedience to certain laws. Gratitude will lead your mind out along the ways by which things come and it will keep you in close harmony and creative thought and prevent you from falling into competitive thought. Gratitude alone can keep you looking toward the all and uh, 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 prevent you from falling into the era of thinking of the supply as being limited. And to do that, would be fatal in your hope. So what he's saying is uh, an attitude of gratitude and praise keeps you from falling to the place saying, well, there, there's a limited of, uh, uh, a supply of resources. There's not enough. God doesn't you know, uh, want to do this for me. It keeps you in that place of expectation. It keeps you in that place of hope. Why? Because when you praise God, you're in a place of expectation. Praise causes us to expect something. Cause praise, praise is a, uh, a introductory stage to coming before the presence of the Lord. Why? Because even in the Old Testament, it says to enter my courts with what? Thanksgiving and praise. This is how we start. It's the start of a process. It's the start of a sequence. It's the start, amen, of a system of what has simply happened. And normally praise comes before the sacrifice. Praise comes before the suffering. Praise comes before the shedding of blood. Why? Because in the outer courts, the first uh, 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 furniture that you come to was what? The altar of sacrifice. The altar of sacrifice. The altar of sacrifice. So when you enter in the courts, right before you get to the altar of sacrifice. So what God is saying is praise me in the mix of your sacrifice. Praise me while you're going through your trial. Praise me while you're going through your frustration. Your lack of understanding. Why? Because that is doing things in a certain way. See, we need to learn to do things in a certain way spiritually and naturally. Why? Because Luke 16, 16 says, from the law to the prophets, that the kingdom of God is preached, meaning that it's spoken. That's, that's, that's the spiritual aspect, but it's also what? It's pressed into in the natural. So there's some natural things that we need to do as well in order to be able to really press into it. So we have to speak the right things at the same time in which we're working, progressing to build our business, to build our families, to build our homes, to build our churches, to build, amen, our community, to build and bring a change in the nation. We're speaking the right things. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, that's a good, 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 good place to praise the Lord. I feel like John, John Hagee. Oh, give him praise and glory. 
Steve, we, we might have to get a clap machine. They ain't, they ain't helping me, brother. I have to be like John Hagee. I got to train y'all with a clap machine. <laughs> if you don't praise them, the clap machine is going to cry out. The law of gratitude is the natural principle that action and reactions are always equal and in the opposite direction. Let me read that to you again. The law of gratitude is the natural principle that action and reaction are always equal and in opposite directions. Action and reaction. Action and reaction. So when you release the right actions, there is a reaction. Amen. The grateful outreach of your mind is thankful praise to the supreme God. Is a liberation of expenditure of force. It cannot fail to reach that to which it is addressed. And the reaction is an instantaneous movement towards you. So God begins to instantaneously move towards you when you begin to offer up praise. What he's literally saying is, the, is, is that your gratitude is a force. It is a law, amen, that God has created that he moves towards you. Why? Because he says, I inhabit the praises of my people. So when we begin to praise, what happens to God? He's drawn towards you. He's drawn into your situation. So you want to draw God, amen, begin to offer up praise, begin to build an altar in the mix of whatever it is that you're going through. Why? Because it is simply a law. It's the law of the Spirit. And if your gratitude is strong and constant, the reaction in formless substance will be strong and continuous. So what he's saying is that the formless substance in, in this atmosphere, amen, is creating. See, everything is created in the atmosphere of God. Because in the beginning, the Bible said that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the earth. Notice that, that, that God was drawn into the mix of the chaos and darkness. And then when God's Spirit came in, the Bible says, and God said, and God said. See, what we've got to learn to do is to speak, amen, into the atmosphere where the presence of God is and begin to create. And the greatest atmosphere to, to create in is an atmosphere of darkness and chaos. Let me say it again. The greatest atmosphere to create in is an atmosphere of darkness and chaos. So the worse your situation is, that you're dealing with and going through, then you have to recognize that the soil of creation, the soil, amen, to activate this formless substance has now been uh, uh, created for you. And now you just simply have to learn to reframe your mind that now I must begin to speak. But what do we do? Most of the time when we're going through something, that when things get challenging, when things get difficult, we speak the wrong thing. We say the wrong thing, and we do not understand that God is a God of chaos. He creates out of chaos. He creates out of darkness. He takes a seed, and he puts it into nasty, dirty, dark earth. See, we, we wash away dirt. We don't want dirt around us. We don't want dirt on us, do we? We don't want dirt in our house. We don't want dirt on our cars. But it takes that thing that we do not want, that we dishonor, to create and bring forth life, to multiply the seed. And so sometimes the things that you devalue in your life, that you detest, that you do not want on you, you do not want around you, you do not want to be in those seasons, is God bringing to you the right atmosphere, the right soil for you to begin to plant your seed into. This is why the scripture says in Isaiah uh, uh, 49 and Isaiah 51 that our uh, 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 words are literally like a sword in the hand of God that we would speak and we would plant the heavens and lay a foundation. So when we speak Amen. What do we do? We plant that seed and that seed. The Bible says, amen, like a corn of wheat, lest it goes into the earth and dies. Amen. It abides alone. It will not bring forth the harvest. So that seed must 
be placed in that season of darkness and chaos. That is the season. When things get difficult and things get trying, when things get hard, now you're saying, okay, wow, this is the place that God has ordained to create when I, can't, when I feel like I can't go on any further, when I feel like sometimes I can't do this, I don't know how I'm going to do this. This is when God is saying that the creative nature on the inside of you begins to take over. Now all you need to begin to do is speak to it, plant the seeds of God in it, put the right words in it, and it will create because it was designed for that season. It was designed for that moment. Just like Esther said that you were born for a time such as this. You were born for a time, amen, when things seem chaotic, when things seem to be over for the Jewish people. God saved you as a remnant to redeem the people. You were born for a time such as this. That's the ways of God. That's the ways of God. Wow. Notice the grateful attitude that Jesus took. How he always seems to be saying, I thank thee, Father, that thou hearest me. You cannot exercise much power without gratitude. For it is gratitude that keeps you connected with power. But the value of gratitude does not consist solely of getting you more blessing in the future. Without gratitude, you cannot uh, a long keep from dissatisfied thought regarding things as they are. The moment you permit your mind to dwell with dissatisfaction upon things as they are, you begin to lose ground. Let me read it again. The moment you permit, notice it says, we do what? We permit. We allow. We allow our minds to go there. The moment you permit your mind to dwell with dissatisfaction upon things as they are, you begin to lose ground. You fix attention upon the common, the ordinary, the poor, the squaddled of mean, and your mind takes the form of of those things. Then you will transmit these forms of mental images to the formless and the common, the poor, the squalid and mean will come to you. And that's what we will produce in that season. That's what we do not want. That is how we have been programmed and we need to reprogram. One of the things that they also said is that you need someone to simply show you, let me, let me read it, I don't want to misquote it. Someone to show you your subconscious lies in you. He said you need someone to show you the subconscious lies in you. Meaning those things of how we think that do not line up with truth. They do not line up with truth. What do I mean by truth? Truth, truth, meaning the truth. The word of God is truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall what? You go to the doctor. The doctor gives you a diagnosis. The diagnosis says that you are sick. You have this disease. Is that truth or fact? What does truth say? What has more power, truth or fact? Truth. Truth trumps facts. Truth says Shut up, facts. Truth smashes facts. Like Apostle Charles says, shut up, facts. <laughs> Truth says, shut up, fact. <laughs> Truth scores facts. It triumphs over facts. But if we embrace facts as being truth, then what does the spirit of our mind begin to create? It creates the facts as being truth, reality. It begins to work towards it. It begins to create it. It begins to reinforce it. That's why a lot of people, when they go to the doctor, and the doctor gives them a diagnosis, and they say, 
Doc, how long do I have? Just tell me. And the doctor may give them a day. And if they embrace it as being true, guess what happens on the inside of them? The spirit of their mind begins to, to work towards that date. It begins to work towards that day. That's how God created us. But if they would change that, if they would reframe that and not receive what the doctor says as truth, but take God's report, because the Bible says, in whose report shall you believe? Whose report are you going to believe? We're going to believe the report of the Lord, especially when it comes down to a crucial situation like that. We better believe the report of the Lord. Amen. If we know what's good for us, we should believe the report of the Lord. Amen. To permit your mind to dwell upon the inferior is to become inferior and to surround yourself with inferior things. To permit your mind to dwell upon the inferior means we, we allow it. A person that's a manic depressant is de depressed because they allow themselves to stay there. They park there. But if they take the fortitude to say, I'm not going to park there. I'm going to park over here. I'm going to park in the truth lot. I'm not going to park in the lot called death, poverty, destruction, defeat, not enough, lack, broke. So to permit your mind to dwell upon the inferior is to become inferior. To surround yourself with inferior things. On the other hand, to fix your attention on the best is to surround yourself with the best and to become the best. Now, one of the things that they found is this. When you practice with the best, you become the best. You become the best. When they did a, um, a biography on uh, Michael Jordan, they said when he was just a young kid, he played with high school kids. When he was just in junior high. And he said when he first started playing, they beat him up, they steal the ball, they would do that. But he kept playing with people that were at a, a greater level of maturity than he was. And what happens is, is when you compete with those that are better than you, you accelerate and you rise up to their level. And so the best in us can never be brought out until we connect with the best until we hang around the best, until we hang around people that have a, a, a greater anointing, a greater drive, a greater momentum, that are smarter than us, that have a greater hunger than us, that are more motivated than us. And we can tell the type of people we are by who our friends are. Some people always have to have friends that they associate with that are on a lower level than they are. They never gravitate up. They gravitate down. Why? Because they themselves want to be the superior one. It's an identity issue. And I'll leave that as a rhetorical question so you can identify yourself. The creative power within us makes us into the image of that to which we give our attention. So the creative power within you makes you <laughs> according to that which you give your attention to. So if you give your attention to righteousness, what is created on the inside of you? If you give your attention to pornography, what is created on the inside of you? Perversion. Perversion. Whatever we give ourselves to is what's created on the inside of us. We are thinking substance. And thinking substance always takes the form of that which it thinks about. 
We are thinking substance. We are thinking substance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We are thinking substance. And thinking substance always takes the form of that which it thinks about. I want you to just close your eyes for a second. Come on, say that with me. Say, I am thinking substance. I am thinking substance. And thinking substance, and thinking substance always takes the form takes the of that which I think about. It's, it's, it's an inadverted way of saying, as a man thinketh, so is he. You are thinking substance. And you take the form of that which you think about. The grateful mind is constantly fixed upon the best. Therefore, it tends to become the best. And it takes the form and character of the best and will receive the best. Also, faith is born out of gratitude. The grateful mind continually expects good things and expectation becomes faith. Expectation becomes faith. Hope becomes faith. See, expectation is really hope. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, doesn't it? See, we got to have hope. We got to have expectation. See, and we just learned that gratitude creates expectation. It creates hope. So when you praise and you become grateful, it creates hope. God, I thank you for this. God, I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you. Thank you, God, that you have healed me. I thank you that you shed your blood on Calvary. See, you're thanking God, and it creates expectation and hope, and it creates faith. Why? Because you're thanking and you're grateful to him for something that you're believing that's already done that needs to be manifest. So as a thinking substance, you're thanking God, amen, and thinking about that thing that you need to be done, and you will become that thing that needs to be done. Is this making sense? So do not waste time thinking or talking about the shortcomings of wrong actions, plutocrats, or trust magnets. Their organizations of the world has made your opportunity. All you get really comes to you because of them. Dale Carnegie, a uh, historian, in his day he was like a, a Warren Buffett, rich tycoon that became very wealthy out of... Uh, I think it was oil and steel, I think it was. He was known for this one thing. He was a man full of gratitude, and they said he never spoke negative of anyone. He never spoke negative of anyone. There was a book created about him called winning friends and influencing people. And the whole book is about never speaking negative. That's hard. You really find out how negative you are. Get that book or get that tape series because you can get it on tape too. When you go through that, you're going to find out how negative you really are. Because it just shines a light on how you think and how you speak about people, how you communicate what you say about people because you're always coming out of your spear with negative things. So what you're doing is you're sowing into the atmosphere negativity. And when you sow a seed, guess what? You reap. It's the divine nature of God. Whatsoever man soweth, what? That shall he also reap. Do not rage against corrupt politicians. If it were not for politicians, we should fail into anarchy and your opportunity would be greatly lessened. God has worked a long time and very patiently to bring us up to where we are in the industry and government. He is going right on with his work. There is not the least doubt that he will do away with a plenty trust magnets, captains of industry, and politicians as soon as they can be spared. But in the meantime, behold, they're all very good, remembering that they are all helping to arrange the lines of transmission along which your wealth will come to you. And be grateful 
to them all. This will bring you into harmonious relations with the good in everything and the good in everything will move towards you. That's really needed for this year's election. <laughs> Believe me, I was listening to, to that last night. And so I'm thanking God. Amen. I thank God. Amen. For what God is doing. And we thank God. Amen. For those who he shall receive. Let's give the Lord a hand clap for this, for this word uh, um, today. So we talked about w one of the ways how wealth comes to us. Wealth comes to us how? Come on, let's say it together. Through gratitude. Amen. Gratitude. How wealth comes through gratitude. So what are we going to do this week? What's our assignment?